Welcome back. Today we are going to look at the other part of naturalistic styles. So let me share my screen and let's take a look. So we looked at classical big C and classical little c last time we looked up to there. And I want to switch to another type of naturalism and that is idealized and then romanticized. So this is taking idealization to a different level. And it was a movement mostly in the 1700s and 1800s. And you can think of it sort of as the opposite of realism. Um, idealization was all about making things perfect as we learned. Romanticization takes that even further. So there are subcategories within that as well. There's Romanticism, there's the Baroque, and there's Rococo. So it's work that's naturalistic, nearly always idealized, that shows a lot of drama and emotion, but it's still lifelike. Um, images of great storms, wars, moody scenes, anything with high emotion are romantic. This usually most often has nothing to do with love in the sense that we're used to hearing the word romanticized. It's all about grandeur and drama. And sometimes it's really grandiose portraiture. And romantic works often look very theatrical. So you can say that in our modern vernacular, it'd be weird to call this romantic, but it truly is in the romantic style of art. definitely theatrical. We saw this earlier on in the slides about naturalistic, I believe when we talked about classical. So this is both classical and then further it's romanticized. Again, these are key, high drama, theatricality, themes of grandeur, painting a perfected, idealized technical style, and often with action happening. So if we go back to this portrait of, of Napoleon, you can see even though it's a portrait, it's still a lot of action happening. Implied sense of movement. Napoleon Crossing the Alps is the title. Napoleon didn't really look like this. He's idealized, he's also in action, which reinforces that projected idealization. He's made to look more grand than he really was. <clears throat> so he's trying to, in this, in this picture that was painted of him, prop up himself. So Napoleon is portrayed as even more grand than he is. So he's made into a hero. He's made perfect. But many of you have heard that he was not a perfect looking fellow. Coronation of Napoleon. The interesting thing here um, is the, the religious signs happening as well. Um, so he was an emperor, but he's, he's in this religious setting. And we can see that um, this is all set up like a theater, right? Like you can imagine this being on stage. I want to take just a minute to talk about the sublime. And you guys may be familiar with Ansel Adams. And so just, just a few slides, a tangent into the sublime. So yeah, an all too brief history of the sublime. So the verb is to cause to pass directly from the solid state to the vapor state, that's sublimation. It's interesting from a scientific standpoint because it differs from the usual common course of things. Matter generally transitions through different phases, like solid to liquid, then liquid to gas, 
and gassed plasma. We can imagine that witnessing something like sublimation before the age of modern science would have been very interesting. But as an adjective, it means tending to, to inspire awe because of elevated quality like beauty, or nobility, or grandeur, or excellence. Um, so what's interesting about this from a philosophical standpoint is when we're seeing what's sublime, we're seeing what is probably scary and beautiful at the same time. So that's a really interesting notion. Um, it's kind of like looking into the Grand Canyon, right? Like it's beautiful because of its power and size. It's also scary because of those same attributes. Um, we might say something the same about giant waves coming in and crashing on the beach. Um, they're sublime. They're beautiful. They are larger than life. So sublime usually is things that are beyond the control of humans, right? We don't have control over what is sublime. It's something beyond our power. Great awe, uh, beyond the understandable. I want you to watch this. It's all about J.M.W. Turner. Definitely fantastic examples of the sublime. Um, if I remember right, this, this video is a bit dry. The narrator is, is a bit dry, but it gives a, a lot of good information and a lot of good images of his work. There was a movie made a few years ago about Turner, and I just can't remember the name right now. Um, maybe if I find that, I'll, I'll do an email or something but it's supposed to be a really good movie. So as we move further in, in years, um, and I've mentioned this, this before, how um, work starts to become, artwork in general, starts to become more um, about personal visions rather than overall mythology um, or overall religious themes. So it becomes more about the artist and a little less about religion or nobility. Um, so Turner takes this into the sublime. So we could, we could say that this is idealized without being perfected per se, right? We don't see like perfect pictorial quality, but it's idealized because um, it's been elevated into a sublime state. So he's showing this great storm, um, this slave ship being, being knocked out of the water, into the water, being drowned, um, capsized. Um, but he's, he's, he's trying to capture the sense of the sublime um, at the same time as he's depicting the scene of the boat crashing. So again, that's, that's interesting because this is coming from a personal standpoint. And, and something almost abstract this is really early for abstraction, but becoming so romanticized and so much emotion gets wrapped up in it that it, it almost goes beyond a picture into just an abstract work of art. So I don't know how many of you have seen the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, a movie by Stanley Kubrick. Um, in it, the, the opening scene there is early man, um, apes essentially, and they come across this plinth um, around where they live and they just can't understand what this thing is because it's, it's this perfect rectangular object, um, it, it, 
evolves a little bit further than, than my generalization, but essentially by them seeing this perfected object, they then are, are curious and they see this, this idealized thing and they start to investigate tools and tool use and so on and so on. So it's, it's like it um, marking the beginning of progress. And later on in the movie, we see the same plinth like on the moon in modern times, um, sort of as a marker and another, um, another spur to more development and more innovation. So definitely see this movie. If you've never seen this movie, it's considered one of the all time greatest movies. The long, but totally worth it. Look at this. We could, we could actually call this kind of romanticized. Right, like every everything we describe is is kind of here. Um, there's there's kind of this sublime quality because there are these uncontrollable creatures. Um, there's idealization, like these troops are made to be perfect looking. Um, there is action happening. Um, kind of everything is theatrical. Um, everything is happening in this image. I don't know why I'm showing the slide again. Um, Friedrich was was an interesting artist as well, and and here we've got the clear depiction of a man staring out into the world, and so it's the individual facing the sublime. So different take than somebody like Turner, um, but but definitely an individualized take still, um, but we're seeing the picture of the man looking at the sublime. Here's some Friedrich work in the Seattle Museum of Art. So if we go, a a little bit further with romanticize, we get to the Baroque. And the Baroque is the showing of the moment of a religious event. Um, super dramatic, super high contrast, deep darks, bright light areas. So Baroque is, is really distinguished because of those technical aspects, the, the way the, the value is used, the way the elements are used. Um, the, the bright contrast against the nearly black background and the contrast uh, of the light running through the composition reinforce what is happening within the picture. I believe I've only got one Baroque slide. If you want to, you could look that up. I don't think there's any test questions about that. I'll make sure there's not um, because we only have one image of the Baroque. Um, but if you want to, you could just search the term Baroque and you'll just get hundreds and thousands and, you know, Google hits. Then we've got Rococo. Um, this is freely, freely, um, highly decorative, way over the top. Um, generally not life and death scenes, um, way less serious in subject matter. So here we, here we maybe do have indications of romanticism in the sense of love. Um, so we can see a Cupid sculpture to the left, um, the woman on the swing, the guy down there in the corner looking up her dress. So this is, this is definitely um, a little more going on here than at, at first glance. Um, because you see her, she's bright against the background. So she contrasts well, but the guy down in the corner kind of blends in a little bit. So it's only after you look at the picture for a little while, 
Do you see him down there? Yeah. This is Rococo. I mean, this just over the top, crazy room, crazy stuff happening. Everything feels light. There's not, there's not serious, you know, deep, dark subject matter. Okay, stylized. So stylization is like idealization taken to an extreme. So the major features of people and things are portrayed, but smaller details are usually omitted. Um, examples of this include conventions like Egyptian depictions of people. Um, conventions are agreed upon and understood representations within a culture. So we, we might say that our alphabet is our con convention analogous to hi hieroglyphics, of course, like that's how we all agree we're going to communicate in writing. The difference though is that hieroglyphs are, hieroglyphs are pictogrammatic, right? Um, they're signs representing real world things while our alphabet is an abstraction representing sounds, which are then translatable into words. So some Egyptian writing does translate into sounds directly, um, but it's more like chunks of words right, like sun god um, or um, I can't think of any, any other good ideas, you know, moon goddess, um, stuff like that. Um, whereas our alphabet is more parsed, it's more strung together, um, it's more dense. So we could say hieroglyph hieroglyphics are chunks of words or straight up depictions of actual things um, where our alphabet is little teeny pieces of sound. Mayan script though is a little closer to the alphabet. Um, it refers directly to sounds that then create words. So newer examples of stylization um, would be advertising posters um, that we see a lot reproduced today. Um, and we see in contemporary examples like logos, like the Apple symbol and the, which is the stylized Apple with a bite taken out, um, cartoons, comics, you know, anime, there's not like the details of the wrinkles on the skin usually um, or the pores on the face. Um, we just see the overall stylization of a figure or a character. Um, this is a great example, Disney. So all Disney stuff is usually stylization. All Disney cartoons are stylizations. Um, and then so it's not a convention though. So we don't all use this way of drawing to depict something. So stylizations um, are different from one another, but we can still see what they are. Um, like this says car, right? Not 1988 Camaro. This says road, not Elm Street, right? So, this sign symbolizes something. It says car, but in a generic way, but in a detailed, just enough way that we understand it as car, right? But we don't see enough detail to understand what kind of car it is. Cat, right? It's not one of my four cats, it's just cat. This, this is a good one. Um, 
maybe, maybe not the greatest stylization. It looks kind of like a bear, but obviously it's supposed to be a dog. Um, good, great example. Guy, dog, right? Not a specific person, not a specific dog. <laughs> this one is just funny because of the the um, arm going down to the child. It's, it's just funny. Some signs turn out really funny. This one's this one's very cute. Um, you know, this is stand away from the edge of the train platform or else you drop stuff. And if you drop stuff, don't try to get it yourself. Ask one of the attendants to get it for you. You know, I love stylization and, and signs like this um, that, that really show interaction between the form of the sign and the actions of the children. Like they'll get out of the boundaries. Watch out. This one's great too. This is from the ice caves here. You could Google Maps this place. It's about an hour away. Really interesting. I've been there and I, I took this picture. Lots of tragic things happening to this figure. I love this. Great stylization of something like an atom being smashed. So, oh, this one, this is tragic. Um, so we can we can understand what's happening by what we are seeing. We we interpret this person as a human um, without needing to know all the details about this person. A lot of stylized stuff has, has cell shading. And that's what you see a lot in comics, right? The like black outline around stuff or in cartoons, the black outlines around figures. Um, this is one of the posters that I was mentioning before, and these are very popular to get reproductions of today. Super stylized. The Apple logo. All right. I think this is the last subject in their nationalism. It's expressionistic because um, expressionistic work is what starts to flow into abstraction. Um, an expressionistic includes impressionistic. Um, they show emotion through the method of application. So the brush strokes themselves show the emotion. Um, the facial features of the subjects are not of primary importance in determining whether or not the work is expressionistic. That's very important for your test. Um, many, many expressionistic works can show very mundane subject matter, like a lot of Van Gogh's paintings. Um, some of them can show dramatic subject matter, but in, in a work like this, we're seeing, you know, it's, it's probably a tree over on the left-hand side. Here's a, um, a town down at the bottom. And, and there's a sky that he has made dramatic 
by his brush strokes. So it's, it's the technique that makes something expressionistic. It's not the expression on your face, it's the technique. Just to be precise, this is called German Expressionism. Um, watch this. This is an example of um, German Expressionism. Again, um, I think it will work on your slides. Maybe not, but it's available all over the the web. So Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is the title. Um, you can watch it on the web, you know, just skip through to see what the style is like. Just a little term, mise-en-scene, it's a French term referring to the way a world is set up in a film. So how is the feeling and style of a film set up? Oh, it does work on my slides. See if I can see a good. Look at these angles on everything. Everything is is really not not quite right. Look at the walls in this. And the sort of brush strokiness going on on the walls. Um, Things kind of jagged, kind of pointy. So there's that aspect of rhythm there. Um, it kind of all feels like it's part of the same world. Um, it has that rhythm. It has those similar aspects of the way the elements are at work, but it's obviously um, not patterns. Um, but that's the way the mise-en-scene is set up. So here we are at the, at the end. We've got types of naturalistic art. We've got realism or realistic. We've got classical or little classical. We've got idealized, romanticized, stylized, and expressionistic. These you should know very well, and you should be able to apply them to pictures that you see. So, I will see you next time, and we will talk about abstraction.